Welcome to Traveling Inside Out. This is Alina, your host. Good morning and good evening. Welcome back to the podcast that explores the world within and out. And thank you for subscribing to Traveling Inside Out, wherever you get your podcast from. And if you could listen to it on Spotify or rate it, that would be amazing. Thank you. As I promised, uh, I am trying once a week, once a month, not once a week, once a month to bring my friend Andra and to talk about things. But last time we talked about our friendship, the beginning of friendship. And now I brought her again because I want her to share a little bit more about her interests in life. And you will know in a moment what I mean. Hi, Andra. Hi, good morning to you and good afternoon or good evening to everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> this is why uh, I start my podcast with saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Because first and foremost, I don't always record at the same time, but also I don't know when people are listening to me. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, for, for, for our listeners, it's 7 in the morning, 7.40 in the morning for me. And it's, I don't know. Uh, 2 it's PM? 2 40 p.m. Yeah, 2 40 p.m. in Romania. Yeah. Did I just do math at seven morning? Uh, in my head, <laughs> that's like, you know what? I, I can't do math in general. Never only seven in the morning. Uh, how have you been, Andra? Good. It's super hot here. So um, if I feel like um, I'm not very energetic, it's because of that, not because I'm, I'm not excited, because I'm always excited to talk to you. Um, but good otherwise. Yeah. Oh no. Okay, there you go. Uh, yeah, I uh, I think summer is starting to slow down a little bit here, which I cannot wait for it. Like, uh, I saw an image, like I saw some news that they are predicting that it's going to be quite a snowy winter here in New York. And I cannot wait because last year we didn't have snow, right? Like, it was just, it didn't happen. Um, oh, so in New York, that sounds lovely. <laughs> So I know, right? And everybody hates because of the slushiness because it's snow for like one hour and then the slush is from all the cars and all that. But that hour is gonna be beautiful. I live for that one hour. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy what you um, can. anyway. So if anyone didn't listen to the previous episode, Leandra, highly recommend it because we really got into talking about the beginning of our friendship, which was which started more uh, almost 15 years ago and yeah, we talked mostly about our beginning and then how we drifted apart a little bit but then we came back together um and so just to kind of finish off that conversation i, I kind of want to ask you andra because we talked so much in detail last time that i want to talk also about the general things <laughs> this time around so then i cover all the bases <laughs> Um, I am curious, I will start basically with what was supposed to be the last question, because if you remember, I had all the questions that I asked almost none of them. Um, so I am curious if you think that our friendship taught you anything throughout the life. Obviously, I'm not talking only about the beginning anymore. Basically, how it impacted my life. Sure. Um, I always felt that I'm, I'm so much in my own head and I do a lot of overthinking and um, I always felt like I can go to you for a reality check and not necessarily like for somebody to like, you know, like slap me twice and like, wake up. No, and never like that. But because you see things kind of like me, but differently enough to bring me your perspective and not to all these, like, I'm, I, I'm not in my own, you know, like, resonance chamber where you just agree with everything I say, you're always in my team, yeah, yeah, I can just complain, and that's it. I, I feel like you get what I'm trying to say and why I have, a, you know, an issue or another, but when I go to you, you, you can always kind of stay objective and say, like, yeah, I, I understand that, but from what the way I see things, it could also be this way, right? So like, especially when you're 
kind of like angry or irritated or heated up. And when somebody tells you like, no, I get it, but it could also be this other perspective. And I'm like, yeah, well, actually I haven't, I hadn't considered this. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, like that, that's really been very refreshing to me to, I, I know I can always go to you for a reality check. That's, um, that's well, that, that's always like with good intentions and well thought out. And um, now I, I know I can get that from you. And, you know, like, there's also the little things, the books that you recommend me, the movies that you recommend that I probably wouldn't get to on my own because, you know, I have my own tastes and preferences, especially with uh, with TV shows and things like that, which there are very few things we, that we both like. <laughs> <laughs> Those are really good. <laughs> we mentioned this before, that yeah. we have very few things in common, including the things that we like in this perspective but sometimes it's good like sometimes and because especially um in the last few years when i'm reading books i'm kind of because i'm i was so out of it i'm reading recommendations out of internet right and mm -hmm. sometimes I'm, I'm starting a book and i'm immediately realizing oh no andra would really love this one mm -hmm. like i'm i immediately thinking that and it's the same with shows and everything else um but yeah, uh, I, I don't have to say that something similar, it's on my side, because you are talking about the reality check. Now, obviously, I'm married to a great man, so I'm fully done with dating forever and ever and ever. But before, um, you were my reality check to understand kind of the standard. You would be my wake up call being like, Alina, that's the minimum. Like, Ali, like, wake up. That's the minimum that a guy can do. All oh, right. Thank you. Because sometimes I'm like, so, ah, you know, and yeah, then you are my reality check. And I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, that's like, no, he, you didn't actually say this. But yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. It is true. <laughs> we are both very happy that you were married to Brian. So, <laughs> yes. And um, for whoever is curious, he was a guest on my podcast right find it uh way before it was just the beginning of our relationship uh i think i should i should go back to this to it actually because mm -hmm. obviously it's been a few years we are married now so i think it would be an interesting listener um um and so then coming from what we've learned along our friendship i am curious is we talked last time that i have lived in other countries same as you uh my countries were mostly either north europe or um north africa or like around the like the north european north africa <laughs> while for you for a while was um eastern asia southeast is that in the southeast is it considered southeast am i being about well, I, I lived in South Korea for like a year and a little bit of over that. I did travel in, yeah. in Southeast Asia, so. Obviously, I, okay. So I'm curious if you think there are any cultural differences that might have influenced our friendship. Again, as we are both born and raised in Transylvania, but lived in so many different countries and throughout our friendship, we've been mostly away from each other than physically together. Mm -hmm. um, I think I did. So I, I guess, you know, I lived abroad two times, both were for studying. So I did my master's in the UK. I was there for about a year. And then um, I was an exchange student in South Korea and I was there for yeah, a semester, and then I stayed a bit over. Um, and both of these countries, like I met great people there, and I made good friends. And um, but the the cultural context in those countries, it felt so, somehow it it feels like it wasn't so easy to make friends with the natives. It was always like making friends with the other expats right because everybody was kind of yeah. like alone there they were moving yes. they were trying to meet people so that that was good and i i did meet a lot of great people in these contexts but because i was in that environment and i understood stuff about the locals the, both the british culture and also south korean they are a little bit more 
closed off. In the sense they're very friendly and very polite, but mm -hmm. there's not this like, you know, like closeness with people, not so instant. Like with us, right? Like we met in the office and like two weeks later we were talking about like our emotional life and whatever relationships. Mm -hmm. Like probably a month later I was sleeping over at your place. There it's not like that, not that's definitely not with the natives. And it felt also, you know, it's the cultural thing and also the fact that people already have their established social lives, their established partners, yeah. whatever. So sure, they will go out with you, but not in the sense that like, yeah, let's be really good friends now because I have this like, I really like our interaction, not so much. And because I was living in that, I, I really did under, especially when in South Korea, when I got there and like you and I, we, we had the like falling out and we were not really mm -hmm. talking so much. I felt like, you know, like you and I, we had something really it, it felt so good and so comfortable and so close and such a nice connection. And I don't want to lose that because it's so hard to find it anywhere else. And even if like mm. things were awkward between us somehow, like I felt, you know what? No, like it, it, it's worth going through some awkward moments if we can, you know, like go back to that and, and build on what we had because it was so natural and so good somehow. So in that sense, it made me realize like what a special thing we had <laughs> somehow. Yeah. So I, yeah, I fully agree. The cultural differences from the countries we were living in kind of brought us uh, in a way closer together because it made us appreciate more where it is not that easy to have what we have. Even though, yeah, we, we drifted apart, but then we came back. So yeah, I fully agree with that. And probably that's what kept us coming back to each other. <laughs> because of seeing what else is there and how difficult it is to get this kind of a picture. <laughs> if this was a romantic relationship, it wouldn't sound very great. Like, oh, I looked outside and like, there are the other people I really didn't like so much. So, <laughs> you get me, I'm back with you now. <laughs> exactly. Um, so because we were talking about how we have very few things in common, and I have talked before with, in my podcast about how I'm interested I'm in psychology and understanding the life within. And also the name of the podcast is, wait, did I put the name of the podcast? Let's put up the name of the podcast over here. Um, traveling Inside Out. Uh, so I like to talk about things that are coming from within as well. You, it's not that you're not interested in psychology because you are. But you went on a different, let's say, path regarding your inner search. So if you want to talk to me about it and just start from the very beginning, how did you get into being interested about, about it? Um, I don't actually remember when this interest began. I know, like, I've, I recently found that I had... Um, like I bought books about meditation when I was like in high school. I recently found oh. it in my parents' house. Yeah. And I'm like, I bought, it feels like for a long time in my life, I was preparing for this. You know how you keep buying stuff that one day you'll start doing this. That one day mm -hmm. only happened four years ago. So I was like 31 or 32. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I had this surge that, when I was a kid, I, I used to go to to church with my grandmother and like I couldn't find sure. any answers there. I, you know, I kept asking stuff and all the all the answers I got from from this orthodox world, they were not satisfying to me. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, like then the, the Catholic world or whatever, I started reading some stuff slowly and then um, I, I, I did have i i think i yeah like for a long time i had this feeling that um there's something about meditation about eastern philosophy i did uh, i practiced martial arts for like a year um but it still was more about like the physical practice not so much about the spiritual practice i got into yoga at some point like six seven years ago but again like i went to a few sessions it was more about the physical stuff not about the spiritual thing i got bored i didn't do it anymore i was like you know i, I really need to find something that's that, that you know that, that's more profound um and it just so happened um somehow yeah it feels like 
my path to spirituality went through the corporate job, which is um, strange in a way. Um, I don't know, but it works. <laughs> it, it works and it makes a lot of sense because um, I, I've spoken about this with um, several people. Even I think yeah, I even told you about this, how, um, it, you know, I, I obviously I have a good job and everything. I just somehow... I never felt like I belong in the corporate world. And like many people, you know, you feel like a little um, cog, like a little wheel in the system. And, it, you know, it, it's very dehumanizing at times. Um, and, you know, I have a great team and at times it's good, at times it's not so good because it's not always easy. But because I had reached this point in my life where I was feeling like, okay, I'm, I'm in this corporate world now, but I cannot allow this to be everything that defines me. I really need to find something um, to, yeah, to, to like to, to find my own spirituality somehow. Um, and uh, because, uh, you know, like I said, because many people feel the same about, um, about this uh, environment, this working environment, there was a group in our company, a well-being group, and they would invite different speakers to just talk about, you know, well-being, um, nutrition, um, all sorts of things. But basically, you know, things outside the job that had to do about with well-being, with relaxation, how to, you know, work-life balance. And at some point, they invited somebody, a yoga instructor, to, to just talk a bit about meditation and, you know, mindfulness. Because mindfulness is, you know, like uh, one of these um, words now. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna go see what he has to say because I was in this point where I was like, yeah, this is this this is not enough. What I'm doing now is not enough for me. So I went to this little conference room and I I saw him, and as soon as I saw him, I was like, I don't know if this guy's the speaker because he was just preparing. Like you know, people were just sit standing down, finding their own seats around the room. But I, I saw I thought that if this is the speaker. I found my teacher. I don't know what he has to say. He hadn't even opened his mouth yet, but I was like, you know, the way he looked, the way he carried himself, he just had this calmness around him that I was like, I want that. I don't know how he does it, but you just feel that some people are very naturally or, you know, at least they're very calm and very calming also. So, um, yeah, he spoke about meditation, he spoke about yoga. We did some practices there. I, I really liked what he had to say. And the next fall, I went to his yoga classes, and I've been going to his classes ever since. And um, he, I have to say that he is the one to really get me into, um, to, you know, Hindu philosophy, um, the Vedic scriptures, and, and like, not so much into studying, but into getting more and more into that. Um, after that, I, I started becoming more interested in Buddhism. I wanted to learn more about it. So last year I went to to Nepal. I spent some time in, in um, a couple of Buddhist monasteries. I did my own uh, yoga teacher training last year in Bali. So it was just, you know, like the things that I was fed slowly, slowly, like kind of like little steps, you know, like little stairs. I started climbing up uh, by grabbing onto like the little things that I was given or fed mm -hmm. by each of these people that I met. Um, I made friends with... Um, um, a lama, a, you know, like a Buddhist priest from one of these monasteries. Um, he's yeah. going to come and visit Romania soon as well. So um, things kind of like started happening for me and around me. And I really like that. And slowly I'm trying to get into this more to kind of, you know, as I learn to also teach people as well, to kind of give back as well. Um but I feel like I still have a lot more learning to do for sure. I mean, that's, you know, just the big lines. I, I, I mean, I, I could imagine that I don't know that much about anything that you just said, but I can imagine that you're never done learning because it's such a big, vast, sub, you might be thinking about the words probably, uh, subject that there's never enough learning. Um, I, I, I read, uh, you, okay, so I'm listening to books now because I have a library card from Brooklyn Library, and so I'm listening to books. But I think I told you about this book, Zen. Oh, I, it's horrible when I would try to recommend a book and I don't remember the title, nor <laughs> the author. Uh, it's really bad, I know. But 
I had to say that I was listening to the book and it's probably, again, without understanding fully the subject matter, it felt to me that it's a little bit more for advanced because I got annoyed at what mm -hmm. the guy said. So I really want you to read it and tell me <laughs> how you feel about it. <laughs> because right. I, got really, I, I did not finish it. And it takes a lot for me to not finish a book, but I will you know I'm, I'm, I cannot, I cannot forget about me. Um, so, and it wasn't the voice of the guy, it, like it, it was, it was the words, the written words. I'm gonna try to find the book that suggested maybe next time. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to say that it's probably a lot and it's probably, as you were just mentioning in levels, because if you are being exposed from the beginning to something that is more advanced, you might be turning away. So it is a very good thing to have it gradually. Because it's not a, as, again, as I'm seeing it, it's not something easy to digest in like one bite. It's something that it's meant for small bites, right? It's, I mean, it, it, it depends on your own, you know, like, obviously it, it's your own path because some people they just they just read one book and they're like you know this is what i want to do i, I met people who like yeah they, oh. they met they re read one book and they were like i want to learn sanskrit now i want to read this in the original language it was written i want to have my you know i want to go to india i want to study there i want to stay there for me it was more like i want to learn i want to understand all of my options not all of my options necessarily but i want to learn more you know like about hinduism about buddhism christianity also and the funny thing is the more i learn about buddhism the more i understand about christianity as well because there's um obviously there are similarities but there are things that i didn't fully understand before because i didn't have the context for it um because maybe I didn't have the understanding for it either. Um, this, uh, you know, there's many concepts that you can interpret at a much, at a deeper philosophical level, but I was always explained it in, I, I was always thought about it in terms of, you know, very low level um, childlike, because, you know, that's that's when I started but going to like I mean, sure. in, in my opinion, Christianity, and I, you know what, I'm not going to put the whole Christianity because I don't know, but like for sure the Orthodox Church, I don't think that it's meant for you to understand. It's just to believe and that's it. Uh, so I also don't know about you, and please let me know. So I studied religion in school since second grade all the way through high school, yet we have never studied the history like proper mm -hmm. history of the religions, never state proper, um, like of the Christianity or other religions. We didn't study uh, the meaning. It was mostly very church-based and mm -hmm. church-forward, let's say, with prayers yeah. and things from the Bible per se, but we didn't learn the big picture of yes religion and spirituality if we can talk about that i well. i agree it was very dogmatic and now mm -hmm. i'm starting to understand the philosophical side of it because i am reading this philosophical side of buddhism and i'm like oh well actually this translates to i, I was talking to the lama about this and he was asking me you know things about purgatory and how this that translates to you know like what happens to souls in purgatory. i i have no idea because i was never taught you know, the actual philosophical things about this ever, even in the religion classes. And we studied, yeah, like religion for 10 years, right, in school. Um, but it was most like, yeah, learn this prayer, learn, do this, go to church, do this other thing. And like, that was never attractive to me. Um, but now we even found that like, you know, this purgatory thing is kind of like, you know, in some ways similar to the bardo in Buddhism because it's like a transitory state between life and death. And it's like, you know, you can have, very interesting conversations i don't know enough about it either but well, yeah I, just like you're saying i'm i'm starting to see the bigger picture because it kind of christianity didn't develop in in like in ether right it developed in a world that already <laughs> had religion. Yeah. buddhism is older than christianity you know like it, it's super yeah. similar to, to islam to everything else so then yes of course if we understand like at least if we see the bigger pictures the bigger picture of all of these we can see you know 
how it evolved. And I'm not necessarily interested in a specific religion, but I feel like there's so many concepts that are valid in one and the other as well. That, you know, th there is some truth. There could be some truth in all of them. Um, but yeah, I, can, I don't necessarily care to practice, about the practice. I can give you an example of something that recently happened to me. So I, I went to, together with my husband, we went to New Haven um, a few days ago. And um, I saw, first and foremost, I didn't, the, the weather was kind of cloudy. I didn't know much to do. If I wasn't interested that much to go and see Yale, and I, the weather was not nice, so I didn't want to go to any of the, to find a lighthouse and whatever. So we just, I just stayed in downtown area. So from the train station towards the downtown area, there was a museum, and I'm like, hmm. It's for free. Let's go. Especially since connected to that muse museum, there was a Ukrainian exposition of, well, man, what's the word? Andra, what's the word? Um, it's not carpet. It's kind of like, the. it's not a tablecloth either, but it's, you know, the, the white, it's like this. We also have it in Romania. And usually they put it on either on walls or on tables. It can have different, yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah, I whoever, for it, yeah. Yeah, me neither. So the point is that that was the main thing, but the museum was about completely different things. So the museum about was about the missionary, I forgot his name, I'm really not good this, but he's the one who uh, founded the Knights of Colombo, Columbus or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I went into this museum disagreeing with everything that I'm seeing <laughs> because it was about missionary that came into New Haven, blah, blah, blah. And mm -hmm. so it was showing there a lot about him, about this knighthood, like brothership that went again from the 1800s or something like that. And so throughout the history and how they helped, they helped in the first world, world war, in the, you know, and including all the way with helping with the war that happens, that is happening in Ukraine because of Russia. So it was interesting to see how much they're helping and so on. But at the same time, um, there was like a thing talking about, and they, they were talking about Mexicans not being allowed to pursue Christianity and becoming martyrs because they got they were killed and the Pope it's like a whole thing but then also there was like a humongous painting for like a huge wall in which it was supposed to represent Mexicans who were trying to be basically coming into this religion and I looked at it and after my uh, travels in South America I'm not buying into a lot of people just willingly choosing to ignore the religion and go for this. I'm not saying that some people did, but the majority, like the population of the country, yeah. did not go because, oh, this is great. We just want to do this. So yeah, we I, like went this. A museum. I went into a museum knowing that it's about missionary and about all of this. And then also the... Um, how we are pro life and stuff like that. So, kind of coming outside from my bubble <laughs> and seeing this museum, it was a bit of trying to put it in a perspective and being like, yeah, this is the world that I live in. And this is still happening. And this is the reality of people. And apparently, they got like back in the 70s or something or 80s or something like that, they got in trouble because it came out that they were kind of racist. And I'm like, think, <laughs> you know, so then they sent an apology, but like they had pictures with American presidents. And, you know, it's like a whole, it's, it was too much for my brain. And my poor husband, he was <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know why we are here. He was just like looking at things and be like, I don't get this. Like, why are we here? <laughs> so anyway, all, all of this to just say that um, 
kind of living in our bubble, we don't fully have the perspective of all of the other things that are happening around us. Uh, and it's, it, is, it can be quite a wake up call when you realize that, wait, the world is not 100% as I see it, uh, because there, there's a lot more to it. No matter how much you travel and whatever you do, but like, there's always a lot more to it, right? For sure. Um, and yeah, it, it's, I, I felt like whenever you travel, you learn more about that particular place where you're going to, but you also make connections with the things that are happening at home. And you always learn, understand more about your own country or your own culture, because there it's things you never actually considered before. You just took it for granted. This is how we do things in Romania. Okay. But then I see that, you know, in Ukraine, they do the same thing in Turkey, they eat mm -hmm. the same thing you know sometimes mm -hmm. i'm like okay so we didn't invent all of this <laughs> i mean our country it it has been so influenced by everyone else because we've been conquered a lot uh, historically speaking <laughs> we are like a a mix of everything with the with the pinch of you know like it's it's a mix of everything um so yeah, I also want to mention, because you said about your talks with the monk uh, back in Nepal, that you have, uh, is it two videos that you put up so far on your YouTube channel? Yeah, discussions with, with him. Yeah, yeah. Um, he gives teachings sometimes to, you know, to the community, to um, um, also in the monastery, to the little monks that study there. But those don't happen in English. Um, but when he does talk to foreigners and when he comes to Europe, he has, you know, the, the teachings that he gives. And um, I, I wanted to record um, because, you know, sometimes he has little nice little um, interesting stories, um, you know, with life lessons based on the teachings of the Buddha. And um, yeah, I, I published two of those videos so far. They're kind of short anyway. Okay, so let's let's take it from the beginning. So first, you said okay, you were kind of searching for something when you were uh, as you were growing up, but eventually you found. Um, can we mention his name? The not the not the lama. The oh my yoga uh, teacher. Uh, yes. No, um, yeah, his name is Val Voiku for who, whoever's interested. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. He's really great. It's only in Romania, so <laughs> awesome. So um, basically, he found you at your job, and then you went to some of his. Then eventually, one year later, you uh, joined his class. So tell me a little bit about how it went, like the first ever class, because I remember you telling me about it as we are friends. <laughs> but, uh, share with our listeners how you felt like the first first class with him was again coming from never done doing this before just knowing bits and bits about it and then how it felt the first first class um it was very different like i said i had tried you know a few yoga sessions in like yoga studios before yeah and it was you know like do the down dog do this do that very you know stretching physical okay very nice relaxation at the end okay go home and it was i it wasn't enough for me and um with him the first the very first class we had um his classes last for two hours and um he starts by giving you a little like talk a little teaching a specific topic whatever it is whatever he feels like talking about during that day um and then you do um different like meditation techniques um techniques to help you focus your attention on your body on your you know like energetical fields i, I don't want to sound like i don't want to speak in these like new agey cliches but it's it's difficult <laughs> to avoid in this uh, conversation um and then you know like you you also do um you know half of the session is physical practice but it's not physical practice for the sake of the physical practice like it's, we're not there to just stretch because of the stretching because the point of you know like the the yoga postures the physical practice the asanas that we do they are not you know in in philosophical terms of course you can do a yoga pose for whatever reason you want it's not a problem but 
in the philosophy, in the yoga, the yogic philosophy, these poses that you do, they are technically geometric alignments to help you. Well, first of all, to kind of um, help you um, move different energies in the body so you can get ready for meditation. And second of all, to because when you're doing, you know, like you're doing a head a, a headstand, I still I don't do headstands. I, I still don't do that. But when you're doing that, it's very difficult and your mind has to be there because if you're thinking about like, oh, what am I going to cook tomorrow? You cannot, you're going to break your neck. God forbid, but still, right? You have to, you, your mind has to be there to do the pose correctly, to keep your balance, to do it. And so because your mind is there, your mind is also getting ready for meditation. You're kind of leaving all of the distracting thoughts aside and you're getting ready for meditation. And because, you know, different poses have different energetic um, purposes, right? If you do this, then it will be, you know, like it's an energizing pose or the other thing, it, it helps you... I don't know, on uh, balance, whatever kind of energy. And so all of the things that you do, they have a, a spiritual purpose because after you do the physical practice, you sit down in meditation and you have to be ready for meditation. That's why for most people, and even for me, um, I've been meditating now for like three years every day, but you don't, you're not able to just like get off of work, you know, have a lot of stress, talk to people on the phone, work, do whatever, children crying, feed the cat, and then you sit down and you meditate for 10 minutes and it's great. No, you cannot because your mind needs to quiet down. And that's why, you know, that's where the physical practice comes for half an hour, an hour, and then you can really meditate because your mind is already like cut off from the, uh, from the exterior environment. So that's what I liked about to go, go back to your question he did that in the first lesson and when i when i finished i was like oh my god for the last two hours while i was here i did not think about anything else except for what he was telling us to do and i really felt like some parts of my body that were just i felt actually my my palms my they my palms were very um somehow like almost electrified. I felt like it's it's very warm. I, I really felt like there's some sort of an energy going there. I don't, you know, I don't know if it was just the way it felt or the way I did, because we were doing some practices with the hands to kind of feel like it's uh, how, how to how to focus your attention there. And I was like, you know what, this this really is something. This is not, this is more than just, you know, like stretching in a pose and going home that I really feel like there's something behind that. And I, I know why I'm doing these now because he was explaining for everything that we did, this is the, the spiritual purpose of it. And so I, that's what I really liked. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep coming because there is more to this to explore. It made more sense to you than just, yeah. So that's why when, when I tried uh, some, it it's on the YouTube channel, it's called yoga. But for me it was, I was strictly doing it for stretching. So for me, I was just, I just needed some stretching to be done, but it was called yoga. And I'm like, I, I don't, I just need to do some stretching because my body right. is not how it used to be. Uh, I just found out, I just found the title of the book that I was referring. So I have to come back to it. It's called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And I'm going to probably not pronounce it correctly. It's by uh, Shumriu Suzuki Roshi. I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, so I'm sorry. Uh, but Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. So that's the book for whoever was interested in what I'm saying. It was too much for me. I didn't finish it. I got annoyed. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll okay. find it. <laughs> okay, so that's what attracted you. And then you, so can you also explain, because you just said that then you went to his classes for ever since then. But can you explain a little bit how long were the classes for like, like how often per week or how many times in total? It's once per year, twice per year, like how, just so we understand exactly what did you mean by Um Right. So, I mean, the way my, my yoga teacher does it, he has two modules per year. So he only teaches in spring and in fall. Um, you know, outside of that, in, in summer and winter, he also goes by himself to study, to, you know, um, to India, to Mount Athos, to all sorts of places. And, and you can tell, right? When he comes back in the fall, you know that he's learned stuff because it's new techniques. It's, it's, uh, it's oh, really great for okay. us. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's for like 12 weeks at a time. 
uh, twice mm -hmm. a week, two, uh, two hours per session. Um, and you really do feel like, yeah, for the, those two hours, it's disconnected. You're, you're disconnected. And what's interesting to me is that, you know, in most yoga studios, wherever you go, wherever you open the door, the people who do this are mostly women in their, you know, 20, 30, 20s, 30s, also 40s, but more, but not so common anymore. With this school that I'm going to, the people that go there, it's people like the average age is over the age of 40. There's also men, like adult, you know, 40, 50 year old men, which is very, very unheard of in, in the yoga world, <laughs> you know, in the Western yoga world, for sure, because we're not talking about India. That's that's different. Um, and you can tell it's people who have a different kind of search. It's not people like there's people who have like back issues and they they can't really do too much too many of the poses, but they do go there and they try because for them it's the spiritual part that matters more. And the you know yeah the, the awareness side, how to become aware of your body, of of your mind, of what's happening there. Um, and it it is different. It, it's a different kind of um, of an audience for sure. And so a few years later, which was last year, uh, you decided to go to Nepal. Now, you talked a little bit about Nepal, but I also um, want you to talk about the fact, if you are comfortable with, so you decided to go to Nepal, exactly as you were saying, because you were interested a bit more into the Buddhism. And so you wanted to go and I don't remember, was it last year that you went also, so you said you went to a few monasteries, but it was like a like a, a tour, like a, a class, a tour, a group. I don't remember what was it. Didn't you book something in advance? What was I, it? Did. <laughs> I did. I did. I don't did. remember. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Yeah, I, I can talk about it. Um, because, you know, like there's so much stuff on the internet. Like I said, I had books, bought over yes. the years. I read this and I read that. And I was like, you know, yeah, I spoke to my teachers while I had questions and it felt like there's just such a big mess in my head because there's so much information and it's unstructured and I'm picking it up from everywhere. And I, I would like to have a more organized um, view of things, not so much for the, the sake of religion, but, you know, for the sake of the philosophy and understanding more, understanding the different paths that people have taken over time towards this big goal enlightenment right like how how do people reach salvation enlightenment whatever and um i was like you know what i'm just gonna i'm gonna try and really go to a monastery and and really see it where where it happens um and i found this um course online it's kopan monastery in Kathmandu. um it's a buddhist monastery that offers courses for beginners for intermediate people it has um i think it has like a one or two courses per month even um and i just took this introduction to buddhism course it was like a week you stay there for an entire week or for the entire duration of the course you're not allowed to get out you're not allowed to get online on the internet to talk to family friends at home uh you know i i told people closest to me okay in the next this year. time you prepared everyone <laughs> yes um I'm, I'm gonna be there i mean of course if something happens they can call email the monastery reception they will come tell you for sure but you know just you can talk to the other the other participants um uh, there are times when you're not allowed to speak at all just so you can be there with your own thoughts and just inwards uh you know focus your attention inwards and and not talk about you know whatever um, and it was very good because that's where I really learned about the basic concepts, the fundamental concepts in Buddhism, um, about karma. Because, you know, we talk about, everybody says karma, oh, this is karma, something bad happened to you, oh, it's instant karma, but we don't actually know what karma means. Um, and now I learned, okay, like what, what it's, you know, it's this big principle of cause and effect in Buddhism. There is no creator of the world. The world was created by karma, which is very interesting, right? Because it's kind of like a law of physics um, in the end, you know, action and reaction, cause and effect. I can kind of get behind that because that's how matter was created in the end. 
Um, and there's, there's all sorts of concepts uh, that I, I really liked. And then, you know, after that, there's so much more, right? Because after you have the basics, then you can you start reading the books, like the one that you just mentioned, and you're like, oh, there's still more concepts that I don't understand, and you can you can go ahead and learn. It. So of yeah. course, it's, it's never ending. But it was it was very eye opening to me to um, to do this course, and I, I it felt it really felt very good. The very the first day or two, it was a bit strange to not have internet access but after the third day it felt peaceful and we were talking with the other participants and we were like you know what like the third world war could break out now and if they tell us fine if they don't tell us we wouldn't know until we see explosions but it's so good though because even if it did start i mean we're in a buddhist monastery like there's nothing we could do even if we weren't here but you know we were safe <laughs> so um it, it felt it felt relieving to be there um, somehow. Yeah, it felt safe in many in many ways. I'm going to compare it with something that is probably very silly of me to compare, but that's me. So I'm owning what I'm, what I'm about to say. Um, not necessarily about the whole experience, but when you were mentioning uh, about the two hours in which you were not thinking, uh, you were you know, your mind was not drifting anywhere else uh, and you were focused on that. I'm kind of comparing it with swimming for me. Well, when I was in Iceland, I used to do laps. And it's not that I wasn't, that my mind wouldn't drift away because it takes a lot for my mind not to drift away. But the fact that I had to, first and foremost, I cannot have my phone in my hand while I'm swimming. So first and foremost, technology is out, right? And yeah. I don't have to focus on swimming because if not, I'm drowning, right? So that was helping me. And what I have realized was that my mind would just drift in one part. So I was obviously doing laps for me was for the physical because I needed to do any kind of training. Because in Iceland, if you don't do it, it's really bad. I mean, it's bad everywhere, but anyway, the point is that usually my mind drifts in five million places at the same time. And during swimming, I had only one thought. So I was realizing what is the one thought that I keep focusing on is something that bothers me or something that made an impression over me during the day or the week or whatever, the situation that I was in. But it was just one thought that would always go that in that specific place. So I was like, hmm, so this is actually more important to me than I thought. Which again, I, I know it's not fully what you're saying, but that's how I can compare it from my side. <laughs> Which in a way it can be like a meditation because I'm not, you know, like I'm being so focused on my swimming that I'm not doing anything else and I'm not being distracted. And the only distraction would be if some other people would come in the pool. So I need to pay attention to them, not to like, you know, bump into them or stuff like that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a very good example. I mean, there are active meditation techniques. You can do, you know, walking meditation where you're really just paying attention to every step that you take and you have your mind engaged there. So because it's in the end, it's about again bringing your attention your consciousness inward not letting it you know dissipate and, and like you said drift away with all the thoughts and things that are happening but just keeping it inside because the the only way to fully live in the moment is to just be there and then without thinking about other things you know like what happened what what's going to happen right now this is what's happening i'm here i'm swimming i'm walking i'm meditating whatever i'm doing this is the one thing that i'm doing right now um so because i know your experience in bali was uh something different i don't think we have time to talk about it so i'm gonna probably you know a bit of a Sheherezada moment uh <laughs> let's talk about it next time um but uh, before doing that, also, I just uh, found the museum that I was talking about. So the name is Blessed Michael McGivney P uh, Pilgrimage Center. I don't know how to pronounce that. So formerly Knights of Columbus Museum. Uh, they changed the name, I think, because of uh, being more aware about natives. 
but the information in the museum is the same. So it's not, you know, I, I don't know actually how it was, but it, it is very pilgrimage forward um, than fully talking about the natives that were on the land. Anyway, so that's the museum in New Haven that I was talking about. Um, okay, so coming back to you, I think I, I'm just gonna ask you a last question, which is probably the wrong question to ask and please tell me, uh, because in a way I kind of want to ask you so far if you found any answers and I understand that the main idea is to just have the questions not necessarily find any answers but I'm still gonna ask you <laughs> did you find any answers so far since like the last in the last four years uh, no, it's, it's a good question. And I did initially, that's how I started. I was like, I want to find somebody who's going to answer my questions because I have some questions and I'm confused. And like, I do get some answers, right? You get some answers about, you know, like specific concepts, uh, you know, like, uh, can you reach enlightenment? Yes, you can. Buddha, the Buddha has, you know, some people say Jesus was also an enlightened person, not necessarily like divine he was a human but he reached the divine the whatever holy status because he became enlightened whatever it's a different conversation but some answers i did get but obviously the more answers you get the more questions like oh enlightenment how how do you do that and how long does it take i don't have a lot of time you know um and then slowly i started um realizing that the point is to I mean, I didn't, uh, you know, slowly I, I got this idea that it's not so much about getting answers to all of your questions. It's about getting rid of the questions. It's about because all the things that spiritually you get, they are not so much intellectual, but it, it's things that you experience, right? It's things that you feel, things that you, you, yeah, you experience, I guess that's the best word. And after a while, and, you know, I had conversations with several people, but somebody told me, and I think this is something that Osho said, which is, um, uh, I, I like this metaphor that in the end, it's not just to get rid, to only get rid of the questions, but to also get rid of the questioner. So even mm -hmm. you yourself, your ego, your, the way you identify yourself in the world, if that, if you manage to make that fade away, to not hold on to your ego, to your sense of self, that is where, you know, that that's really the true path. So not even, not to get answers, not to even like get rid of the questions, but to get rid of yourself, even this, this sense of, you know, this, this fabricated, inflated sense of self that we all have, especially in the Western world. Um, that is the right path. Um, to get rid of yeah it's like a man of a, a man made of salt entering the sea you know like it dissolves immediately because it just <clears> becomes <throat> one with the ocean right one with the sea so that's i guess i, I really like that metaphor how yeah how it's so visual i can see it yeah I can yeah see I, it. <laughs> that that's the thing right to become one with everything that is I, I like that metaphor that explains it because it's not like you don't exist anymore. You don't die. You exist, but you just, you know, you dissolve in the ocean because you are the ocean, you're salt. Um, and you know what it, it reminds me? I don't know um, if you've ever read anything by Paolo Coelho. Mm -hmm. I did. I, I read Have a couple you? of books. Yeah, I was kind of like, I usually go through stages, which I'm not in one right now. Uh, but I usually go in stages uh, liking an author that I'm reading like as much as I can and then something makes me move away and then I, I'm finding another author and it's, you know, it, and it's so, it's kind of funny because from Paulo Coelho, I went to John Saul who wrote like thrillers or like horror <laughs> books and stuff like that so it's like just to understand my stages are stages like i'm not even kidding uh but i was recently thinking that maybe i should go back and read again power of radio because i read it when i was university student so <clears throat> almost 20 years ago oh my god um i would be interested i i'm thinking to go back and reading because maybe i would uh relate differently now to his books and what he said or maybe i would find it completely like okay nah i'm yeah, not i'm not this anymore i think yeah. i think i want to go back so when were you were you reading it like back in 
uh, what was yeah. it like early 2000s or like mid 2000s yeah i think um uh, 2010 best, i mean yeah my, my best friend was reading the alchemist in like high school at some point because that i think that's where yeah it yeah well i started at the end of august uh, of august of high school and then yeah and I, you know, she, she gave, she read the book and then she, she gave the book to me and I read that. And then I read, um, after going to university, I think I read the one with Veronica. Mm -hmm. Um, I, and I, read, I think I have them too. I still have them. I have as well. books. Both of them were, uh, I received them from, <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I don't think I ever bought a Coelho book for some mm. reason, uh, which is also funny. Uh, and I think I read another one, but yeah, it was back in university, like yeah. first, yeah, like after after I finished my my studies, I did not read them anymore. Um, and I think I would probably feel I don't know. I was actually thinking about The Alchemist quite like a month ago. So me too. <laughs> we didn't talk about yeah. it. That's crazy. In the last yep. few months, I've been, I I've been thinking. I didn't say this out loud at all. I didn't even think. I, somehow, yeah, I just got me thinking. <laughs> yeah, it is. I like, We're probably now in that stage where we're like, oh, that's what he was trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm living it. Back I, back then, when I was 20, of course, I wasn't quite living that. Yeah. Um, really but I feel like I would get a lot of... Um, Buddhist references, at least, or maybe not even Buddhist references, maybe Sufi references as well. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Mm -hmm. But I, I could actually, I would be curious to read The Alchemist again. Read it and see. Yeah. Well, we let's do it. Out. Let's do it. Andra, <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. The next episode, let's talk about it. Uh, because it's an easy read. I remember it was like a very. Yeah, it was. It, it was. I was, yeah, going through. <clears throat> you know what's funny? I, I was trying to learn Portuguese. Duolingo and all that, but then I stopped. And my dream back then was like, oh, I wish I would be able to read this in his language. Mm. Uh, not happening anytime soon. Um, yeah. But maybe I can read it. I think I was because I have them back home in Romanian, so now I'm going to read them in English. In English, um, yeah, I English. yeah. So, so I'm gonna see. But uh, yeah, let's do this. I also have to mention before we end the episode that I'm gonna take a break for October for September and we're coming back in October. But Andra, so basically we have one month and a half. Let's do this. Let's read the freaking book and come back in next episode we can talk about it and then also we can talk about Bali. But Perfect. before we end the episode, please let me uh, tell me about your the most recent uh, interest which is guided meditation. Give me in a few words what you are trying to do for whoever might be interested, maybe they can find you somehow. Yeah, tell me everything. <laughs> uh, it's it's super new, actually. I'm like I said, I'm trying to um, get more into it. You know, I feel like um, recently people just started coming to me because you know they know I've I've done my yoga teacher training course because I study meditation. They're like, you know what? I'm really stressed out lately. What should I do? Oh, I know you're meditating. Uh, can you recommend some things to me? And I'm like, some people even, some friends even asked me, like, would you do an online session? And I was like, well, I hadn't considered it because I don't feel like I have anything to tell you guys, but I can try. Um, and the first thing that I did was um, just last week, it was just one thing, uh, really just family and, and close friends. Um, it wasn't necessarily guided meditation. I mean, it's, the principle is kind of the same. It was yoga nidra, which means uh, sleep yoga. It's like yogic sleep. And it is guided. It's a guided process. You just lie down and then you listen to the voice of the person who's guiding you. So I, I was guiding, you know, the, the people. Um, and it, it's supposed to bring your mind into the state in between sleep and being awake where you can really relax and also where the mind is very open to suggestions right so you tell yourself i mean you tell yourself um you think about um yeah you can you bring an intention something like you know i love and i accept myself the way i am or uh, i am at peace now or whatever you want it's, it's you can choose whatever you want and then because you're in that stage kind of like uh you know um somewhat uh going in the direction of hypnosis almost but it's you know it's not really a hypnosis but it's it's in this stage in between um 
wakefulness and then sleep, your mind is is absorbing the, the things that you tell it to absorb. And then, you know, it's your subconscious mind is working towards that. So that's the point of, of uh, yogic sleep. Um, and then you're um, technically, if you do that um, in the evening before going to bed, you're going to have a very good, um, a very uh, resting uh, night sleep at night because you know you're relaxed and your mind is ready to drift away so i did that with a few friends um the feedback was good um people people were happy with it so i'm thinking i'm going to start doing uh probably a more regular thing uh with friends first but maybe i'll i'll open it up um when i when i feel confident enough i'll open it up for um for others as well uh and then yeah maybe do some guided meditation as well even though meditation, true meditation is not necessarily guided because like I said, meditation is about going inwards. And if you're listening to somebody's voice outside of you, your attention is still outside, but it helps a little to, um, to relax. Perfect. Uh, you were just mentioning some uh, statements that you can have. One that is difficult for me is I am enough. That's a that's a hard one for me. Uh, when I was telling you that I was doing that stretching, um, the lady in the videos, she would have uh, like statements at the beginning of the session in which you should think about and so on. And a few times I was crying. I was I was saying whatever she was saying and I was crying because I didn't believe what it was. Yeah, what it was. And I'm like, I, I'm not meant to cry <laughs> or maybe I am. <laughs> But, uh, uh, yeah, I was just, um, for whoever wants to try this, at least in my case, it's hard to do the I am enough. It's a hard one. So I have to mention that when we talked about all of this, you kind of mostly told me about, like, from traveling point of view. So I've learned a little bit more uh, from this episode than when we talked about it. It's like you shared a lot, but it was mostly from the traveling part. And a little bit less about this so i i've really enjoyed it uh because i i am a bit curious about all of this but i guess i'm not asking you enough again you know yeah. <laughs> but i don't want to sound preachy because um yeah you know like when you start talking about <laughs> Even my mom, when I was telling her, like, uh, oh, I'm going to this month. And, and this year also in April, I went back to Nepal to stay again yeah. in the monastery. And she was like, she didn't know how to ask me. And she was like, are, are you converting to Buddhism? <laughs> and she was like, you know, like a little bit, not necessarily worried, but she was like, so are, are you considering? And I was like, no, it's, it's really not. It's just to learn to study. And I, I actually like being there. And the discussions I have with the Lama, they're really cool. And I enjoy it. But no, I'm not interested in converting to any religion. Um, that could so be another that, conversation. That yeah. could be for sure another conversation. How are your parents and other friends reacting to, or if they see any change or anything? Like but let's keep it for next time. Okay. People do ask me if I'm part of the sect now. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So <laughs> that could be a conversation. Um, yeah. So, yes, thank you so much for joining me again. We are still going to try to do this once a month. Uh, but as I was saying, I'm going to take a break for September and coming with the new season uh, in October. And we will see by then between you and I how we're going to have our schedules and so on. If we can still do it once a month, we can talk about it. I don't want to promise because I keep promising to my listeners stuff that I never do. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm really trying. Uh, but at least I'm not promising anymore. So it's, I'm still somewhere. <laughs> you know, like I, It's still an evolution, I would say. Uh, stop promising so. Um, yeah, so thank you so, so much for joining me again. And I'm looking forward to next time talking about Paulo Coelho's book. Let's see if I remember um, to do it. But I'm going to read it. It's going to be easy to, <laughs> to go through. I'm pretty sure it's really easy to read through. Yeah. So, yes, if you have any other words at the end, if not, I can say goodbye. That's, that's great. No, it was lovely talking to you again. And um, I'm happy that you feel like you learned something because we, we talk so much together that, uh, you know, if you still have things to learn from me, then I'm like, oh, that's a plus. <laughs> <laughs> always, always, Sandra. <laughs> Forever and always. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
This concludes today's episode. Thank you for listening and for reviewing Traveling Inside Out. If you want to get in touch with me, send an email to podcast at alinaigrad.com. And remember, your outer journey begins with inner work. Until next time, bye!